Okay, well, welcome back, everyone. I, I hope you had a nice break. Personally, I did my five minutes of yoga since I'm essentially stuck on this stool to 9 p.m. Uh, this evening. That was seemed like the best thing for it, but I hope you enjoyed your drink or however else you spent the time. We've got a really exciting session coming up now with four trade specialists joining us to debate essentially the, the issues that we set out um, in the earlier session. Um, just in case you're just joining us, uh, I'm Natalie Bennett, Green Party member of the House of Lords, and I'm chairing this for the Greenhouse Think Tank and the Green European Foundation, uh, trying to be as minimalist as I can. So what we're going to now is a debate around the question, starting from the UK, but of course from many different perspectives. We've got trade and climate negotiations that are happening in parallel, beside each other and pulling in very different directions but we've only got one world, they both set the policies have to operate within it. How can these agendas be reconciled? And we've got four great speakers to address that question. Uh, we've got Saskia Brickmont, who's a Belgian Green politician and an MEP since 2019. It's on a number of committees, including the Committee on International Trade. We have Jean Blaylock, who's the campaigns and policy manager for the campaign organization Justice Now. Anna Cavazziani, is a German politician from the Alliance 90, the Greens, uh, since 2019, also on the Committee on International Change, Trade. And Ellie Chowns, who's joining me on a Zoom call for the second time in a week. Um, it was our MEP uh, for the West Midlands uh, when we had them, as we now sadly don't. And he's a councillor on Herefordshire County Council and the international spokesperson for the Green Party of England and Wales. So I'm gonna call on our speakers in that order um, to answer that question of trade and climate negotiations pulling in different directions. But to make sure everyone's staying awake out there, just a reminder that after the, these speakers have spoken, we're gonna go again into small breakout groups and have a discussion before we come back to the speakers for a Q and A. So starting with you, Saskia, if we may, um, how do we reconcile the trade and the climate agendas? Hello, everybody. Thank you, first of all, for this uh, invitation and, and for allowing us to, to speak today with you um, and for the very insightful presentation and this uh, also excellent study uh, that would be very interesting to reproduce in, in the other um, countries. Uh, so this is a, a big question and with Anna Cavazzini we, we will um, present you issues that are now on the table of the European Parliament and that are being negotiated now and where we can uh, influence because as you pointed uh, the Green Deal is presenting very strong objective a zero carbon um, society by 2050 although uh, what we see is that uh, two main European policies where we could act, where we could influence, um, which are the CAP, so the Common Agricultural Policy, which also uh, emits a lot of emissions, and uh, the trade uh, policy needs to be reformed in order to really uh, become compliant with um, the Paris Agreement and uh, the Green European, the Green Deal at the European level. Um, so I, I will focus my intervention on the, the TPR, the Trade Policy Review. Uh, it's uh, now open and it's after the, the Trade for All strategy uh, from, from 2015. Um, this Trade Policy Review is now open to consultation. Uh, it has been launched in June and it, the, the purpose is to review the EU trade policy, uh, its achievements, uh, its functionings and its goals. So um, the European Commission has submitted 13 questions um, and every NGO, citizen, the parliament, um, national parliaments also can answer and contribute to this reflection until mid-November. So I invite you all to contribute and uh, of course a specific contribution on, um, on climate would, be, would also be uh, helpful, uh, helpful, I think. Um, so what is at stake is, of course, to bring trade policy uh, within the framework of the European Green Deal. Uh, that's uh, one of the main uh, goals we want to achieve also. And this is uh, something that um, we wouldn't have achieved with Commissioner Ogan, uh, the previous commissioner, but uh, uh, we're now putting our hope uh, if it 
even if it won't be a revolution, but still it has another approach. Uh, we think it has another approach is the new commissioner uh, designates uh, Dombrovskis and we will be holding the hearing soon, um, beginning of October. And of course, we will uh, ask him questions about his view on the future of trade policy at the European level and how he thinks he can make it compliant with the Green Deal. Um, so what we have to know is that today there are about uh, 200, 250 multilateral environmental agreements that are uh, into force dealing with various environmental issues and around 20 of them contain provisions to control trade to prevent environmental damage. But um, the enforcement mechanisms uh, are absent today in most of them. Uh, which is something we need to improve, of course. And um, what also needs to be known is uh, that their consistency and compatibility with the WTO rules have never been uh, challenged. So this is important to know because it's uh, often we hear that, okay, new mechanisms, new regulations need to be compliant with WTO rules. And that's, uh, of course, also a debate we'll have um, when it comes to the debate on the uh, carbon adjustment uh, mechanism at the borders. And this would be also an interesting topic for a new session because it, it's, it's debated now in the, um, at the parliament level. So free trade agreements and investment agreements should explicitly reckon that multilateral environmental agreements will prevail over trade provisions. Uh, this is uh, something we're working on, of course. And in case of a dispute, um, we should discourage parties to initiate WTO disputes uh, to challenge other parties' adoption or implementation of FTAs, consistent climate response measures. Um, we can do that through uh, our trade agreements. Um, it's today not sufficient to solve the problems only by focusing on environmental provisions uh, and commitments, because uh, we know uh, that uh, trade liberal liberalization, growth in exports of particular products is correlated with the development of unsustainable production techniques. Um, however, environmental degradation is in general uh, highly linked to other issues like poor institutions, poorly defined property rights, or inadequate regulatory and fiscal policies. Uh, we also need, and uh, this is uh, another challenge, to make the Paris Agreement an essential, an essential clause of the free trade agreements. Um, it's possible to mainstream climate and biodiversity and also human rights uh, goals in trade policy. Uh, I take an example, and I, I think Anna will come back on, on this issue specifically of the EU-Mercosur agreement. Um, the deal, as it is drafted, won't prevent further deforestation, uh, while studies and a recent uh, study on the impact of trade on biodiversity really shows it. Uh, studies show that deforestation significantly increases over the three years following the enactment of a regional trade agreement, uh, which coincides with an increase in agricultural and land conversion, of course, uh, because of the, the, the New Deal. Uh, we also need to improve and to work on a, a, a real grievance and remediation mechanism. Uh, and this is interesting to note that the new uh, Chief Trade Enforcement Officer, which has a, a, a transversal role uh, to also include the uh, sustainable development chapters uh, issues in, uh, in trade, so he announced a forthcoming initiative uh, yesterday in INTA uh, to really adopt uh, a grievance and remediation uh, mechanism. Uh, it's important also for compelling partner countries to, to act. A reform of the WTO uh, is also needed. It should offer an opportunity to push forward the possibility to distinguish products according to their process and production methods. It has been said, uh, we need also um, to work with developing countries and they should be compensated in case of adverse impacts of such uh, measures 
and take into account the common but differentiated responsibility principle. Uh, this is also something uh, really important for us. It's also uh, something we mentioned in the EU Africa strategy, where uh, INTA also INTA international trade also plays a role. Um, and what we should really also keep in mind is that when we as Europeans uh, implement the European Green Deal, um, it has consequences. It has consequences for the partner countries. For instance, a higher protection of habitats in the EU can also result in important deforestation, uh, water and air pollution in other countries and more generally uh, natural resources depletion. So we need to bear that in mind in order to really work uh, in partnership because, of course, uh, we need to work on uh, resilience and um, relocating uh, strategic productions. And it has been said before in, in the previous panel, um, but we really have to think globally and act together with the partner countries um, in order also to allow their to develop their own uh, resilience and not to impact further um, the situation in uh, the partner countries and specifically the development uh, developing countries. So I will uh, end it here for the, the trade policy review. I think it's a, a real great opportunity to rediscuss uh, the, um, the future of uh, European trade and international trade. Since uh, the outbreak of the crisis and the, the COVID crisis, we feel, and, and Anna uh, can contra contradict me, but I think um, in the European Parliament, there's more uh, sensitivity to issues such as resilience and uh, the, the need to work on the supply chains and to, to go forward um, on, on the climate issue in order to, to revise uh, the way we, we lead trade policies. Although, of course, uh, um, colleagues uh, and, and right-wing colleagues, uh, of course, are still um, in, in a kind of a conservative approach. And this is uh, something we really face really hard in the International Trade Committee, um, uh, which is uh, much more conservative and business as usual minded than the Environment Committee, which just adopted, um, which just voted on the new climate law uh, and adopted a, a more ambitious goal, um, diminishing by 60% the emissions by uh, 2030, which is uh, ambitious. So we'll see where it leads. And of course, uh, for more coherence, trade policy needs to be uh, aligned on these uh, climate goals. Thank you. Thank you very much, Saskia. And um, you know, it's good to have some positivity in there. I suspect more positivity than we're going to hear when we get to the UK. Although I will also note that the um, uh, David Newman was commenting in the uh, the chat box that um, you know, chaos theory at work that it was the rules, the COVID rules being bro broken at a, a golf day in Northern I in a golf day in Ireland that led to lots of things changing about the approach to EU uh, trade policy. But now we're going to move on to Jean Blaylock, who's the campaign and policy manager for Global Justice Now, who I assume is going to reflect on what's happening in the UK Parliament. And you, we might not be overwhelmingly optimistic about the EU, but I'm afraid, certainly from my perspective, um, it looks worse in the UK. But, you know, Jean, hopefully whatever good news you can give us, as well as the bad, that'd be great. Over to you, Jean. Thanks very much. Um, so... Uh, yeah, just to, I, I work on the trade campaign at Global Justice Now. For anybody who doesn't know us, we're a democratic social justice organization which campaigns as part of the global movement to challenge the powerful and create a more just and equal world. And for us, trade campaigning is a key part of that. And the, the question posed around that we have trade and climate negotiations in a single world pulling in different directions is, is, a, is, is a, a key example of why trade campaigning is one of the things that we work on because yes this is um, this is this is a major issue I, um, in the in the UK um, we the UK government is attempting to do uh, several high risk trade deals in a hurry um, in the context of brexit of which the most scary and frightening is the US-UK deal. 
Um, we know, for instance, uh, leaks from the negotiations about that, that in about the second meeting that they ever had, the UK um, tentatively raised the issue, shall we talk about climate? And the US said, no, absolutely not, never. If you want to talk about climate, the entire deal is off. And um, in all of the, uh, the meetings that those leaks showed uh, the responses from thereafter, there was no further discussion about climate. Um, and I mean, the question, the two, the two sets of negotiations, um, the problem is that trade negotiations and trade agreements, trade deals are powerful. Other than a military or security issue on the international stage, a trade agreement will override everything else, including climate um, negotiations. We have given trade agreements teeth, we have given them meaningful sanctions, uh, and we have allowed them to dictate to everything else. And that's a problem um, because trade deals therefore can block climate action. Um, they, you know, in a couple of ways, in, in general, we know that at the minute um, we've had a lost decade, well, we've had more than one lost decade, but the, you know, of inaction over the climate and we really need a step change um, to actually change, uh, step up a gear in what's actually being done. And for that, we need binding regulation. It's the only way that we are going to force major corporations uh, and changes in policy around the world is to have real binding regulation that will make people change direction. But trade deals are written to prefer and to privilege voluntary self-regulation. They will have clauses written into them, they're called necessity clauses, um, that say that uh, regulations and rules and laws should be the least burdensome necessary um, to achieve a, uh, an object and it is therefore always possible um, for corporations to say well the least burdensome necessary is voluntary self-regulation and that's a strong driver against any climate action that we know that we need to take. Um, trade deals also have provisions in them, the notorious corporate courts, um, ISDS, uh, Investor State Dispute Settlement, which allows corporations to sue governments outside of the national legal system for amounts far higher than they might be able to get for anything that they might challenge within domestic law um, in courts that only have to look at investors' rights. And we've already seen these being used to challenge um, climate decisions. So we've seen um, in uh, uh, the Netherlands at the moment, where the Netherlands is phasing out coal power and is being threatened with a corporate court case from a company, Uniper, which owns coal powered fire stations. Um, and we see this is being used in a way to sort of create a chilling effect um, for other governments who might consider the same, or at least ensure a massive payout for corporations, so that if they're going to lose out, they want to get they they want to get more compensation than they would otherwise be entitled to, which is something that we can see happening in Germany at the minute. The same sort of thing is happening in Canada as well with ISDS. Um, trade deals can also make the climate crisis worse. They encourage. Um, trade in fossil fuels and fossil fuel intensive sectors at a time when we should be keeping fossil fuel in the ground and they can undermine a just transition. Um, so uh, steps that we need to take, some of the enablers that are talked about in the report, um, the need to, 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 to have targeted subsidies to uh, build a sustainable economy, the need to make sure that things are focused on building decent jobs so that people do not lease out. Globally, the need for technology transfer between the North and the South, all of these things could be ruled out by um, trade deals. Um, so what do we need to do? Well, to you can't really reconcile these two things. What we need to do is take away the power of trade deals. Um, we need to stop them being able to override the uh, rest of international law um, and, uh, the, and ensure that instead they support the policy and goals of um, other areas of, of policy making, whether it is climate, whether it is health, whether it is food, all of these things that go towards building up a more just and sustainable world. Um, I mean, it's mentioned um, the problem of ensuring that the things that we want to do do not conflict with the trade rules. Trade rules are not given, they're not, you know, they're not just a fact of life, they are created from policy decisions. If trade rules are causing a problem for us taking action on the climate, we need to change the trade rules. Um, that is, is, is a base, we need a fundamental change really in what trade deals are for, so that they are not about removing barriers from 
um, the, for, from trade. They're not about en en enforcing an extreme free market view, but they are instead about pushing boundaries and responsibilities on trade to ensure that they can actually support um, the goals that we need from elsewhere. And as well as that basic change to trade policy, in the short term, we need to stop the bad high risk trade deal. So we need to stop a US trade deal. We need to stop the EU Mercosur trade deal. I'll leave it there. That's great. Thank you very much, Jean. And that set that out very clearly. And you may hear some of those uh, words repeated back to you from the House of Lords uh, in, uh, I might be borrowing some of your phrases next week. Um, our, we're going back to the broader European perspective now with our next speaker, Anna Cavazzini, um, who's uh, perhaps a European, but also a German perspective um, and part of the Trade Committee. So over to you, Anna. Yeah, thank you, Natalie. And also um, thanks, Saskia and Jean, for, for your input. Um, I can very well build on, on what you have said already. Um, and also, of course, thanks for the invitation. I also read the report with a lot of interest. Um, first of all, because um, we usually face um, difficulties in calculating the CO2 impact of trade agreements, and not so many researchers are doing that. So for me, um, the report was very, very interesting to read. And also um, some of the conclusions, I mean, we, for example, as German Greens have really difficulties to speak them out, like we need less trade. We have very um, hard times to really be super, super open about this. We have like a lot of things we want to change, but the report is also really making a point for like having less trade at the end. And I think it's, it's a very valuable thing to, to discuss as a, as a kind of end goal. Um, so Saskia and Jean have already um, outlined the big problem, like the scenery, and also talked about the, the huge things we need to change. I want to give two very concrete examples. Um, Saskia and me are working on in the European Parliament and previously also Eli, who was also a member of our um, International Trade Committee and a very, very <laughs> good um, and smart colleague that we are with, missing a lot. Um, yeah, um, as Jean has put out, um, the big problem is that um, trade agreements really have kind of the function as an international constitution. So they have like they're above EU right, they're above national law. Um, so the way how international trade agreements are shaped really has a huge influence on our policy making. Um, and you can see this very well with two examples that I want to um, address today. One is the aforementioned Mercosur agreement. So the EU is already um, negotiating since 20 years with the Mercosur countries like Brazil, Argentina, Uruguay and Paraguay. Um, a trade deal um, of the old sort, because the mandate is 20 years old. Um, and we think as Greens that this Mercosur deal is really one of the worst examples and probably the best illustrations why um, international trade agreements are bad for the climate. Um, because as Saskia mentioned it already, you have on the one hand rising agriculture exports from the Mercosur countries, especially Brazil that yeah will very likely lead to more deforestation because the cattle and the poultry and the ethanol has to be grown somewhere and on the other side you don't have um, sanction mechanisms or proper enforcement mechanisms for good things like human rights or deforestation of Paris agreements that is also mentioned in the agreement but cannot be enforced so um, we are at the moment um, trying to really stop um, the negotiations or bury this agreement um, because as the European Parliament, we cannot put forward amendments. For us, it is like impossible to, to put forward amendments. This is also um, one reason why often it's so hard to change trade policy or to change the course of trade policy. We can only say yes or no at the end. Um, so the green strategy is at the moment to bury it. Um, when we talk about which kind of deal we would like to have, if the Greens were like in having the absolute power or whatsoever, um, we always try to say that it is important that we have deforestation free supply chains to really make sure that none of the products that is exported um, leads to higher deforestation rates 
in, in the Mercosur countries and that mostly clean goods are basically um, traded, but not the dirty goods. Um, and other um, bad example um, of trade policy or of an agreement that is out now in the world is the Energy Charter Treaty. Also, Jean mentioned it when she talked about the very dangerous investor state dispute settlement mechanism. So the Energy Charter Treaty is an old treaty from the 90s. Several states are members, like the EU countries, but also former Soviet Union countries and some other countries. So in total, I think 58. And um, this agreement makes it possible for fossil fuel investors to sue states when they change their energy policy. So when they kind of phase out coal, when they phase out fossil fuels, and then it is possible for them to um, go to a private international, like, um, it's not even a judge or it's not even a court. It's just like a private um, kind of court system and um, sue the states for a lot of money. So we think this treaty also really hinders um, the energy transition. And the interesting thing is we are fighting at the moment to reform it or to end it at EU level. And it's not even only a green position. It's also the position of the commission and of majority of the groups in the European Parliament. But it's so hard to change because any change of the content of the treaty needs anonymity. And as I said, you have like 58 states. You have also states like Azerbaijan or Kazakhstan or Jap Japan who don't want to change anything. And if you get out of the treaty, you have a 20 year sunset clause, meaning all these like dangerous rules, they still apply for another 20 years. So the Energy Charter Treaty is another like example of first how international trade agreements or investment agreements hinder the energy transition. And it is also an example second for how difficult it is, even if you have a consensus, you have a kind of consensus in the European Union on that, um, to change something because they're kind of set in stone. Um, so with this, I also lead to my last point. I think um, the problem is at the moment that trade policy is like a or trade agreement, the international trade rules, the WTO rules are really set in stone and are really hard to change. Um, and even if in the European Parliament, we managed to kill an agreement, for example, probably we kill the Mercosur agreement, who knows? We kind of killed the TTIP agreement because, yeah, it was so much activism and campaigning before. Okay, then Trump was elected, but I still think it was mainly the activism and, and, and politicians who killed it. Um, but that doesn't mean that then the structural changes are coming. So you kill an agreement, but still you, you haven't won the big, big, big run. And that's why um, it is very important what Saskia mentioned, the trade policy review that we really at the moment put so much pressure on the commission that they come up with some structural changes. Um, campaigning and civil society is again super, super important. Um, and of course, I think, mm, this is my last point, it is important to change a little bit the rulemaking of how international trade is being made. Um, for example, we Greens ask for the European Parliament also voting on the mandate. So the mandate is at the beginning of a trade negotiation. So far, it is only the Council and the Commission who decide on what is in the mandate. It's like the negotiation directive. And the Parliament can only say something at the end after like six years, seven years, 20 years of negotiation. So we want that the Parliament is from the beginning included in the decision maker on, on the negotiation directives. Um, and that also ideally we, we are able to put forward amendments to, to the negotiations or to the text um, because um, like this, only having a yes or no at the end puts a lot of pressure on the parliamentarians to say yes because it was negotiated so long and the narrative is always like, yeah, we need more free trade and whatever, we need more export opportunities for our businesses. So it's, it's very hard to, um, only say yes and no, I think it would be better if we could put forward also amendments. Um, I leave it here. I could talk forever about trade, but I hope it was like um, more or less understandable what my points were. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Anna. I think that was very clear. And um, it's really from a uh, British parliamentary perspective, just hearing, I understand why you want more control and control that starts earlier, but the idea that parliament has any control at all um, over uh, uh, trade deals, you know, that's what we're fighting for and what we'll be fighting for in the trade bill, because at the moment, effectively, um, since we've left the EU, the British parliament has no say in this at all which is something that I suspect uh, Ellie Chowns might be going to uh, um, comment on, but we haven't had a pre-discussion for this. So I'm just going to hand over to Ellie to say what she wants to say on this topic. And before I do that, just a reminder that we'll be having a short group discussion about this and feel free also at any time that they occur to you to post questions in the chat as some people are already doing. So over to you, Ellie. Thank you, Natalie, and thank you, everyone else. And I have to say, it's such a pleasure to see Saskia and Anna again after all this time. And um, thank you both, and to Jean, for your um, really interesting and detailed contributions. I'm going to be much more general and broad brush, and I'm setting a timer for three minutes. I'm just going to be really um, brief, I think, um, partly to make up for the fact that I don't have any detailed knowledge on this topic really anymore from the um, from how I did it the, um, when I was on the International Trade Committee. But I just want to talk about a couple of things. My first response to that question, how can you reconcile the climate and the trade negotiations when they're operating completely separately was oh, clipping heck. <laughs> I don't know, you know, isn't that the kind of core real difficulty? Operating in separate tracks, we need to get them embedded so that trade and climate are kind of really working together. And I think people have touched on a couple of things. So regulatory regulatorily right so uh, we've talked about how there can be environmental kind of um, clauses in trade agreements but they need to be enforceable and they need to be enforced which requires political will and pressure perhaps there's more to be done in terms of valuation so that the environment is valued in similar terms in which kind of the benefits of trade are valued economically and so that that can be integrated too that's one dimension um, so I'm talking about, you know, the carbon border adjustment proposals, that sort of thing. The second dimension is kind of philosophically, right? We've had decades of emphasis on globalisation in which the globalisation that's been talked about has all been in terms of trade, increasing, uh, increasing kind of financial connections around the world. And, you know, look where that's got us. It's not been it's not been a great path, but we have to admit that it has had poverty reduction benefits from a lot of people. The massive reduction in monetary poverty in China, for example, is directly related to their engagement in trade. And so, you know, what we need to do is move away from that type of globalization to one where we're thinking globally in terms of the biosphere, but we're trading locally as much as possible. And I think that, that that is what the report, the greenhouse report that we're discussing today has set out so clearly in terms of the kind of blockers and enablers, how we can move to that. And that's not in any way similar to the sort of dynamic that we've got in British politics at the moment, which is talking about kind of more local control over trade, but in a really kind of closed minded, terribly destructive sort of way. We can see that um, that trend within global discussions as well. It's not just a UK thing, but it's really, really kind of um, emphasized by Brexit. And that brings me on to my third point, really, which is politically, how can we get these agendas aligned? And the truth is, by getting people into positions of political power who are absolutely committed to integrating trade and climate. Now, we have a particular problem in the UK. We've got an appalling electoral system. We have total underrepresentation of the sort of progressive views that are represented by Jean and by Anna and Saskia. We've got to change that. And I think that there's an element of kind of hope in what Anna was saying just then about activism, changing things, you know, activism on Mercosur, activism on TTIP, activism even on the, on the Vietnam case, you know, we didn't kind of win that, but activism is important. It does kind of, it keeps the pressure on, it makes some shift happen. That takes me to the end of my three minutes. I'm gonna stop there, but I think we have got to not give up and be active in politics and on the streets on these things. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Ellie, for your uh, very much discipline, uh, self-discipline, and also thank you um, uh, for setting out a positive vision of doing things ourselves. You know, I have a saying that politics should be what you do not have done to you, which feeds very nicely into our next session, which is discussion in groups of four. Um, you'll be sent off to rooms. You pretty, should be pretty familiar with this by now. A chance to toss around with a few other people, share your thoughts, and perhaps come back with some questions. Do type them in the chat box as they occur to you. Uh, and we'll come back to our panel to reflect on those questions and what each other said.
Okay, so welcome back everyone. Um, I hope you had a, a nice chat there. Um, a reminder to everybody to stick any comments, uh, questions that you have in the chat box, um, where I'll be picking things up from. And I'm going to start with the question that David Newman put in about, um, and it perhaps broaden it out a little as well. Uh, David asks, with the UK government willing to break international agreements, and here, of course, we're talking uh, about the internal markets bill in the UK, which would um, overwrite, tear up the withdrawal agreement that was only agreed earlier this year. And I'm going to direct this to either Saskia or Anna, whoever would like to pick this up to start up with, off with. Um, could this be a precedent for other states overriding trade agreements on non-trade policy grounds, which is uh, an interesting positive take potentially, David, on this. And I think also I'd like to throw into this mix, perhaps starting with Saskia and Anna, um, we didn't mention that the UK, and I know the government is very keen on the idea of free trade zones and setting up free trade zones in the UK um, at the end of the Brexit transition period. So I guess you, what impacts positive and negative do you see current and future UK policies having? Perhaps Saskia, if we could start with you. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I didn't find a mic. Um, I think Anna is really much more on the, the UK-EU negotiations uh, um, and, and so it would be interesting also to, to go to her. Um, so far, I have to say I'm, I'm in doubt about what, what's going to happen and taking a little bit, uh, um, de-zooming a little bit. I just uh, chatted uh, briefly with uh, Gina. Uh, about the possibilities um, to, to still um, in some way uh, influence each other positively also. How can, how can um, we keep our tights or, or uh, links, UK and EU, in order to uh, go hand in hand together? And I don't think we, it will be possible <laughs> with Johnson. Uh, let's hope that the uh, future politics will, 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 of course, change and that we'll be able to build on new bases, even if, uh, if uh, Brexit uh, goes through. Um, I think we still uh, together need to, to work hand in hand. And uh, I also believe that uh, uh, we can be a model as Greens, and, and I, I don't talk only about uh, the political side, but also as, as uh, Ellie mentioned, that we have uh, to be stronger together, NGO, civil society, think tank, uh, academic level and, and political level in order to show that we can uh, work together. I, I take the example of the uh, insane flows, uh, uh, imports and exports of products uh, of salmon, for example, uh, from uh, the UK and the EU that is exported and, and at the other side we import uh, almost as many uh, tons of uh, salmon uh, from, from other countries. And we have together to rethink those flows, those imports and exports in order to uh, uh, relocalize and uh, um, become more resilient and this is true for the uk this is true for the other uh countries and um i think we have to 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 keep working that way even though on a political level for the moment we are in this trouble um with uh with johnson thanks saskia for reminding us that this is only a, a temporary situation um perhaps anna if you'd like to sort of come in on your thoughts on on the uk's impact and what 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 difference it's making um in the current situation yeah um thank you so much first of all one word on on the question of breaking international trade rules i mean it is always somehow possible because as you know there is not an international police or not an international army luckily like that will intervene if, if you break international rules but what you can really see is that um trade rules are much stronger enforced than for example human rights conventions or other environmental rights so i i i think this is a huge imbalance. There's the imbalance between human rights and trade rules, basically, in international enforcement. And you can also see that very little states actually break international trade rules, because at the end, I think it's also about international reputation. It's about 
fearing the loss of investors or whatsoever, but often really trade um, as states, for example, do if the what the WTO says, if there's a court case at the WTO or something. Um, but of course, the person who is at the moment breaking all international trade rules is Trump, <laughs> no surprise, he's just doing whatever he wants to. Um, and you can see that this also creates a huge chaos and a huge like downward spiral. So I guess the option is probably not breaking international trade rules, but really trying to change them. This would still be my personal, um, my personal way forward. On the second question, um, I find it quite interesting that the European Union has such a, such a strong stance on this level playing field. Um, and it is not only the Greens, as you know, it is really like the EU Commission, the chief negotiator Barnier, the majority of the parliament, even the conservatives, you know, they kind of made this very, very strong. And level playing field is, of course, at the end, a tool to prevent social dumping, environmental dumping, and to prevent what Johnson was talking about, these like export zones or whatever, to make Great Britain like a assembly hub um, and work with dumping. So um, I, I think probably like, and I, I'm sure you're doing that already, like the Greens and also civil society should at this point of time really trying to influence, put pressure on the government to accept this level playing field idea because it means high environmental and social standards, I guess. Um, so what is the last sentence on that was really surprising to me is that the EU is so firm on it because when we started negotiating whatever in February, I was sure that the Greens will be probably the last one, ones in the European Parliament at the end fighting for that and that the EU will just give in to Johnson, but so far they didn't. And I think this is at least a good thing, although of course I'm also worried of what will happen if this chaos continues and that there will be no deal at the end. Thank you very much, Anna. And yes, I mean, worrying about no deal and just offering a personal view, I think crash out, as I would describe it, is now the most likely outcome. But perhaps, Jean, um, you're the logical person to come to with that question about asking about um, you, what civil society, what's being done, what pressure's being put on the UK government and how you see really the political landscape. So over to you, Jean. Uh, yes, I mean, I, I think, well, clearly there's a lot of pressure at the, at the moment um, around uh, both um, the EU negotiations and the US negotiations, because it, it, it's, it's, a, a, uh, it's not a coincidence that the government has chosen um, to run the two negotiations in parallel, that at the start of the year it very deliberately um, uh, decided to start formal negotiations with the US at more or less the same moment as it began the formal negotiations for an EU deal. And that's because, I mean, this issue of the level playing field, um, it, I mean, there, there, there is pressure from so many, somebody in the chat was talking about the CBI, for instance. I mean, what, one of the, the unusual things at the moment in, in the, is that you see um, organizations like the CBI struggling to have any influence whatsoever over the UK government, um, because for, for, for many of um, the, the people within government who are the leading proponents of Brexit, it is exactly to change our regulations that they saw the point of Brexit as being. So, I mean, there's a story in the news today about Dominic Cummings say, um, talking, in not, not about climate issues, but around um, digital issues, online issues, uh, and saying, well, one of the, you know, the, the, the great opportunities um, of, of Brexit is to tear up um, the EU's rules on privacy and GDPR. Um, so, I mean, I think it's, it's important to understand that for many people, the, the, the purpose of these kinds of trade negotiations is to move the UK away from the EU's um, pattern of regulations towards the US pattern of regulations. And here, I mean, I, as a trade campaigner, I end up talking about chlorine chicken far more than I would ever really want to talk about chlorine chicken. You cannot escape it. Um, and, but it's, it, it's merely iconic. It's the, the issues that, that, that come around an issue like that. They're not, it's not 
the issue is not about one product, or whether we're going to start importing one product onto our supermarket shelves. It's whether we're going to import the entire US regulatory approach, whether we're going to move away from the precautionary principle of the EU, um, the, the, the whole approach that basically puts the burden on a, uh, a, a manufacturer or a seller to prove that something is safe before it goes on the market and that if there is uncertainty um, to, uh, to, to take a better safe than sorry approach, uh, as opposed to the US approach where the burden is put on the consumer or the regulator to prove that something is dangerous for it to be taken off the market. Um, and that, that I mean, this, it, 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 it's entirely clear that for many in the UK, um, well, uh, okay, for, for people like the Trade Minister Liz Truss, for Boris Johnson, that's an opportunity for them to move to the US regulatory approach, which includes on environmental regulation and on climate action. Um, and it's clear that one of the reasons that um, Trump wants a deal with the, uh, with the UK is to undermine the EU. I mean, it's not that the UK is that important to him in itself, but one of the things to do is to peel the UK away from the EU's regulatory system. I mean, there's a lot at stake in these um, types of trade negotiations. It's, it's, not, it's not just about sort of what you might think of as trade. It's really about, um, well, in some cases, our entire approach to how we want our society to be governed and regulated. Sorry, that got a bit ap apocalyptic. <laughs> no, thank you very much, Peter. I think perhaps you've illustrated, particularly to our um, uh, European guests, it's something that I think generally across Europe has not perhaps been widely understood, although perhaps is becoming more understood, is how much Britain now has a far right um, Trumpian government. Um, and also just to comment on the chlorinated chicken, one of the things I find whenever I um, talk about that, because it is a useful shorthand for that whole deregulatory US type approach. I get lots of people coming to me saying, well, I'm vegan or vegetarian, so I'm not really worried about the chicken, at which point I point out that there's also scores of pesticides used on fruit and vegetables in the US that are banned in the um, EU and currently in the UK. Um, so, you know, being vegetarian or vegan doesn't get you out of the chlorinated chicken argument. Um, I'm just going to come to Ellie for uh, some final comments because we're just about out of time. Um, but I think there was a question in the uh, chat box from Les Lebedow, um talking about how um, often, so I've lost it on, on the spot, but basically talking about how you know, as Greens, as people from our side of politics, on the left of politics, we tend to get really involved and engage in things like um, environmental committees, get engaged in um, um, you know, committees about labour rights, those kind of issues. Um, you were on the Trade Committee when you were an MEP. I guess it would be interesting to know, you know why you did that, what barriers you found, how um, that's influenced your thinking going forward. Um, you, I think this whole report today, obviously, is Greens very much engaging in these issues, but what was the experience and what kind of reception did you get? Over to you, Ellie. Uh, interesting question. Um, I mean, I, I chose to be on the Trade and International Development Committees because that's kind of my professional background and that's sort of what I've gone back to now with um, uh, uh, with my work at the university. But I suppose, you know, there's a broader question there about kind of greens getting involved in areas that are traditionally not seen as green you know people expect us to do environment committee type stuff and not, maybe not the kind of the stuff with numbers on it you know about jobs and uh, uh, international trade and so forth and I think of course we've absolutely got to engage in it and for me personally as an experience working with amazing people like Saskia and uh, the rest of the team you know actually, actually greens have got an awful lot of really important stuff to say on trade as this report kind of demonstrates as well. And I think that I suppose we bring a kind of, um, you know, we're very values driven, right? So we bring a, an approach to discussions of trade that is very much rooted in concern about people, concern about the environment. We don't just think that trade numbers are abstract. We know that they have real, real costs. And um, I mean, if I could just kind of reflect back on the, a couple of the questions that David Newman also asked in the chat that were, that were reflected on earlier, you know, that one about 
um, whether Boris Johnson's example of breaking international trade law could be uh, could be a model for others. I mean, absolutely not. Obviously, <laughs> we've already seen that Boris Johnson's government is very happy to break our own domestic law, as they did with suspending Parliament last year. Now they want to break international trade law. You know, where where does it end? I really don't know. And I'm totally with Anna on this. You know, breaking stuff is much easier to do than building it up. But that is actually what the European Union. That's one of the things that I really believe believe in and believed in being a part of it you know it's doing that careful patient close you know detailed work of trying to build up better ways better rules that we can all collectively live by and work by um, and then there was another question from David actually which was about um, having decision makers share the costs or pay the costs of the decisions that they make and the environmental damage that that does and that you know that fundamental principle pollute pays is so kind of fundamental to what greens are trying to achieve and absolutely you know perhaps there's stuff that could be done to extend kind of magnets type laws to cover environmental damage as well i don't know perhaps that's a perhaps that's an agenda but fundamentally i think that um as, as we've seen actually with gdpr that gene was just talking about you know greens have actually got a lot to say in areas that maybe tradition you know beyond the sort of environmental areas like privacy like digital that actually it just is just so important to have greens in the room saying those things and making those arguments i can i can only absolutely agree and i want to say thank, thank you. you very much to all of our panelists i think that was a really fruitful discussion if i can just take the chair's prerogative for a minute or so to reflect back on that I must admit I agree with everyone who said you know, breaking rules is not the answer. I think um, Johnson has done lots of rule breaking in the UK and I very much suspect we're about to see with Trump um, if he loses the election an attempt to break, entirely break the US Constitution, which is going to be put us into some very difficult, challenging times for the US and possibly for the whole world. And I think what you just said, Ellie, about the Jitski SARS sanctions, of course, that makes me think very much of the push to have a global law on eco side, um, balancing the, um, the, uh, the genocide law. And I think that something that we haven't perhaps really focused on, all, but we've certainly talked about and around a lot, and we've seen lots of questions in the chat, is the question of do you ban things or do you tax them really heavily? Those are some of the questions that we really um, are sort of asking and tackling today and perhaps this report tackles. So I'm going to finish now. We're going to finish pretty well on time. Um, so I'm going to hand back to Anna or whoever from um, Greenhouse is um, going to sort of do the final wrap up technical things. But I really, again, want to repeat my thanks as chair to everyone who's spoken today, everyone who's come along and participated and um, ha had a chat and posted questions. I think we, we've done our best. We've had lots of discussion about democracy and we've done our best to make this within the limits of our technology, um, a democratic, kind of event. And I think that's really made it much richer. So thank you, everyone, for your time, for your participation, for your knowledge and contributions, and handing back now uh, to um, Anna, all the organisers. Thank you ever so much, but Natalie, for doing such a great job chairing. I'd like to thank all the speakers and everybody for contributing and everybody who's put questions in the chat and who, who participated in the discussions in the breakout rooms. I particularly like to thank Peter for doing all the technical stuff as well as doing his presentation and, and everything. And Sarah Finch, who's perhaps hasn't been prominent in this, but has been very much done a lot of the behind the scenes work in organising this event. Um, so please fill in the short feedback survey that you could be getting. And on that survey, there's a couple of boxes that you can if you want to receive news from Greenhouse and from the Green European Foundation, so hopefully won't overwhelm your inbox. Um, now, as part of this project, there's a few uh, mini reports that are that will be be produced uh, soon. What about how to frame sustainable resource use and how this intersects intersects with climate the climate challenge. And the second about the infrastructure requirement for zero carbon. Um, can we build our way out of the climate emergency? And the other, just to flag finally, a few other greenhouse publications that are relevant to this issue. One is uh, Another Brexit is Possible by Emma Dorney. So that's uh, putting the sort of case for 
uh, the UK post Brexit becoming more uh, self reliant, if you like, rather than going for the you know the global Britain type um, uh, aim. And and also Jonathan Essex his report, uh, the UK Climate Emergency Plan that faces up to climate reality. They're both on the Greenhouse websites under publications and reports. So if you scroll down on that page, you can see all our various reports. Um, so I think that's it. So thanks ever so much for, for taking part. So thank you very much, everybody. <laughs>